Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our DATIQ weekly market update. This is our update for, uh, my watch is failing me, October 18th, 2022. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics over here at DAT, joined by Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst, and we have a super special guest who looks just fabulous in scarlet. We have Matthew Leffler, the armchair attorney. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. So... So for those not tracking, we had a little bit of a swag swap wager, and I am just graciously, it's, Matthew sent me such a nice jacket, and it's so cold here in Ohio. Um, and, you know, Michigan State beat Wisconsin last week, a common enemy, so I figured I'd wear some, uh, some what color is this, green? They just call it green? Yeah, go green. Go green, Kevin. Go, go, go green. green, yeah. But we had a little friendly wager on the Michigan State-Ohio State game, and uh, Ohio State sort of beat up on, on the Spartans a bit, so I figured... As a consolation prize, I would wear this lovely piece of swag that Matthew sent me. But well, I appreciate tomorrow. it, man. Thank you for sending this wonderful T-shirt. I got to make sure I always mention the Ohio State. It's not the the. the. That's that's important to note. Absolutely, I, I'm very particular on language. It's been trademarked, right? I have a shirt <laughs> that got trademarked that just says the on it. But it's like super pre- like even by my standard, it's too pretentious to wear out. So I just keep it at home in the closet, just knowing that I have it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid of being pretentious, but that's a little too on the nose, I think. I'm so, excited to be here, guys. Thank you for having me. I've, I've been watching the program. I love what you guys are doing, and I'm, I'm excited to be part of this conversation today, talking all sorts of things, law, supply mm-hmm. chain, whatever else you guys want to chat about. Yep. Yeah, so for those less familiar with the show or just tuning in for the first time, we, uh, we're we here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern. We're talking about trends we're seeing in the freight markets um, every so often. More frequently, as of late, we are uh, joined by special guests, which I think make the show a lot more exciting. Uh, from a format perspective today, we're going to hit the market update rather quickly because we have um, a really great uh, legal discussion with Matthew here in a bit. So with that, I'm going to go into the key points a week. We'll bring Matthew back in about 10 or so minutes. So let's hop into that. So uh, I think the biggest story, quite frankly, in the trucking markets the past week and a half has been diesel prices coming back with a roar. Um, I think it's a very unwelcome development for most carriers, and Dean's going to touch on that in a bit. Uh, but overall, I think over the last two weeks, we're up over 50 cents a gallon for retail diesel prices. Um, again, Michigan State, uh, ton mile index flattening around 3% year over year. That's put together by Jason Miller and one of his counterparts up there um, at that state up north. Uh, flatbed equipment posts are now exceeding 2019 records by 2%. Uh, toy imports up 5% year over year. Uh, Coastal shift in freight. And then I like this last one, uh, the new North American pumpkin record uh, set at 2,560 pounds or 853 pumpkin pies. That's a lot of uneaten crust uh, here in the next month or so by children around America. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean for our market update. Dean? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, there's some of the growers we talked about in Bloomington, Illinois, where a lot of pumpkins come from, we're a little bit concerned about yields. This year, a drier summer, late start to the, the crop planting season due to heavy rains. Um, my advice would be to get your pumpkins early. Uh, they're talking about a shortage this year of pumpkins at Halloween. Uh, so let's have a look at the load post volume, start off the market update. We'll do a quick update this week. A lot of the details will be in our market update published this evening. Uh, so apologies for the brevity. We want to get to Matthew as quick as we can. So go to dat.com forward slash market update. Um, in the load to truck ratio, um, sector uh, volumes did drop back below just under a million loads last week equipment posts were up the load to truck ratio dropped by about 14 percent to 3.03 loads per truck in refrigerated uh, fall harvest is underway as we we just touched on load post volumes are up in a lot of the pumpkin markets in iowa and illinois uh, but that's not enough to move the national needle volume still declined last week they were down about 16 percent um Equipment posts are still pretty high. Capacity continue, uh, continues to loosen, so the load-to-truck ratio dropped to 5.66. And in flatbed, after jumping 13% the week prior, flatbed load posts fell back last week by the same amount. A lot of that volume in the week prior was, of course, related to Hurricane Ian, a lot of flatbed volume surging into Florida. That has cooled off since then. Um, so capacity was pretty flat last week. Load-to-truck ratio didn't move that much, but it did it drop slightly from 14.3 to just under 13. Uh, in the market condition index, uh, one of the questions we had last week from one of our viewers, I think it was David, if my memory serves me correctly, asked about the California market. Uh, it's a huge freight market. It's only one of two states where you can have a 700-mile 
plus length of haul. Uh, Texas is the other one. So in this week's market update, we've spent a lot of time digging into the California freight market. It's a top five freight market, uh, home to two of the largest ports and also the fifth largest economy in the world. A lot of freight volume moves both uh, medium, short and long haul. Uh, in, and David, this week we focused a lot on the Los Angeles and Ontario to Stockton freight lane. You can see all of that detail in our market update. In uh, the refrigerated uh, section, market condition index showed us this week that outbound rates from Atlanta to Lakeland still increasing. A lot of volume moves into Florida during the recovery period. Atlanta is a big distribution market. Rates are at 323 a mile this week. Still a dollar thirteen a mile lower than this time last year. Uh, brokers and shippers are finding plenty of capacity to move volume into that market. Um, the number of the volume of loads moving on this lane, just for a reference point, before the hurricane made landfall. The volume of loads moving at Land and Lakeland dropped 34%. Uh, and then in the week after, uh, volumes jumped 62% the week after Hurricane made landfall, but still retreating back to normal levels. Uh, capacity continues to tighten in the Pacific Northwest, particularly in the Yakima Valley. Uh, produce season still underway up there. Rates are up to $2 a mile, up 83 cents a mile since June, and, uh, and will typically peak at December this year. And having a look at the flatbed market condition index, uh, one of the things we wrote about in this week's report is the oil fields. Uh, the number of oil rigs, according to Baker Hughes, continue to increase. Uh, in the Permian Basin out near Lubbock, uh, oil rigs are up 46% year over year. Um, that has resulted in uh, a contribution to the volume of flatbed loads moving between Houston and Lubbock doubling in the last year. A lot of freight comes out of the Houston market, and of course Lubbock is out in the Permian Basin. Uh, capacity is still very flat, though, when you think about spot rates. Plenty of capacity to move those loads. Line hole rates remained unchanged at just over $3 a mile this week. And wrapping up with our year-over-year -year look at spot rates, uh, following the third biggest weekly increase in diesel prices um, the last week, the other two were, of course, just a few months ago, spot rates dropped by just over $0.07 cents a mile to $1.81 this week. As Ken mentioned, diesel was up again yesterday by $0.11, cents, up to $5.34 per gallon. Uh, that'll probably suggest more downward pressure on spot rates uh, this week. Uh, we saw something similar in 2018. As you can see from the chart there, when Hurricane Michael made landfall as Cat 5, along the Florida Panhandle in early October of 2018. Diesel jumped seven cents per gallon that week. That pushed dry van rates down by 10 cents a mile the very same week. Having a look at our refrigerated sector, uh, surging diesel prices, of course, uh, impacted dry van, reefer and flatbed equally. Rates were down about $0.08 cents a mile nationally in the reefer sector, averaging $2.11 compared to this time last year. They're about $0.74 cents per mile lower. But as you can see, identical to this time in 2018. And wrapping up with our flatbed year-over-year -year look at spot rates after being relatively flat since September, line haul rates have dropped by over $0.07 cents a mile last week, similar to the other two trailers types as a result of the uh, drop in diesel flat, flatbed rates averaged 214 last week just over 50 cents a mile lower than this time last year and with that it's up to over to ken for the uh, uh the short the short-term forecast and we'll come back to you shortly with our question of the week thanks team so um uh, just as a quick note we are kind of expediting through some of the market stuff here. You can find Dean's full market report on our website. He'll plug it at the end on how you can find it. Um, so national spot rates, we're going to start with uh, dry vans. So the blue line, just to refresh everyone's memory, is a historical seven-day weighted moving average of long-haul dry van shipments, excluding fuel. You can see there rates were actually rallying um, heading into some of the peak shipping season before that disruption in fuel. And we talk a lot, a lot about this um, on the show. Um, Fuel prices are inversely correlated with changes in baseline hauls. So when fuel prices go up sharply um, in a short period of time, that puts downward pressure um, and then vice versa. It's usually more impactful when prices go up than when prices go down, though, unfortunately. Um, so what you see here is the impact of that change in fuel. What you're seeing with rate cast, though, so the green line is rate cast, the red line is the short term forecast, and then the other is a gray and the yellow are blended. Uh, they're pretty much in consensus that things should um, smoothing out, bottoming out there around that dollar seventy-five ish or so line, and then heading up as we get into the Black Friday run-up. Let's move over to reefer. Again, a more pronounced drop. you got to keep fuel in those reefers as well. Um, those refrigerated units, a bit more of an impact there. Uh, but again, very similar shape to the, for the consensus forecasts of all four models heading into Black Friday. Uh, let's just pop over to flatbed for a bit. 
you get to see two interesting short-term dynamics here on the blue line, which is the historical. You see the um, nationwide impact of Hurricane Ian and then the impact of fuel. Uh, this is probably the most tightly aligned forecast because it's not as impacted by the retail shipping peak. Um, again, troughing out a bit and then starting to inch up as we get towards the holidays. What you're going to see here towards the holidays is less. You know, there's not a lot of retail freight moving on a flatbed. Uh, but what you are seeing is a lot of um, capacity constraints as we head into the winter and into the fall, which tend to push rates not into the fall. We're in the fall, into the winter as we push rates up. So with that, we are going to move to our question of the week, Dean. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, the question of the week is uh, sort of sets up our intro to Matthew. The question is, what are the three top legal issues facing our industry today? And with that, it's over to Matthew. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you guys for letting me be a part of the program. For those who don't know me, my name is Matthew Leffler. I go by the moniker Armchair Attorney. Our supply chain is something you can't opt out of, and you can't opt out of the law either. And so some of these really interesting trends we've been following for a while now is what is an employee? We see this with AB5 and news from the FTC looking to change how we understand what is an independent contractor and what is an employee. We look at things like nuclear verdicts. We hear about these all the time. What is a broker uh, responsible for and what is a nuclear verdict really mean? Um, Brandon Wiseman, if you're watching this from the uh, TruckSafe uh, group, I'll just be clear. Uh, nuclear verdict is not a real thing. It's a term of art created by the industry. It's just a number that mm -hmm. usually means oh over $10 million. And then we have this trend, this, again, this trend of what broker liability looks like. So these are some of the, the biggest legal topics that are facing our industry today. So Matt, I guess like with the, um, let's maybe start with employment classification because that's kind of the big kerfuffle, if you will, around AB5 in California. Can you maybe just like set the stage for sort of like the acute implications of what that means across the industry? Absolutely. So AB5 is this growing trend around what it is to be an employee and what it means to be a contractor. The greatest innovation in transportation in the last 40 or 50 years was the advent of the independent contractor, an entity that is able to perform work at your direction where you don't have to pay unemployment, you don't have to pay um, medical insurance or any of the time off that they might have, no wage and hour compliance. And this is how freight moves so efficiently. However, a state like California has come in and said, we're going to change some of the ways we identify independent contractors. That's what AB5 is all about, with the presumption that a driver who is classified as an independent is actually an employee. And it's up to the hiring entity to prove that they are, in fact, an employee or an independent contractor and not an employee. So how does that and again so for those less familiar like just to bring us back to um kind of practical terms you might be familiar with uh when a ups driver brings your amazon package to your doorstep they are an employee of ups next time you get a delivery from fedex ground pay specific attention to the the door the the, the door of the box truck or the bread truck whatever they arrive in and you'll see the name of the company that fedex is contracting with to for that route Right. So just pay attention the next time you're on the road or the next time you're getting a package that and it even gets trickier. Right. Because all FedEx Express couriers are FedEx employees. But FedEx Ground is an uh, independent contractor operation. That's the so, same thing with Amazon as well, Ken, is this idea of taking that risk and outsourcing it to somebody else. Let you focus on your core competency. And to your point, FedEx Ground and Amazon are great examples of independent contractors. Same with all the gig companies. Someone's delivering your DoorDash, your Grubhub, your Uber Eats. All of these companies are using independent contractors or sole proprietors. And so they're able to offset their own cost structure by having the independent contractor deal with all of this. And because our nature of our business is so so dependent on independent contractors, it has really changed the way a lot of companies view the risk. Because we mentioned California. If you misclassify somebody, the liabilities are substantial and non-insurable. So it means all of your back wages will be paid. All of your back PTO will be paid. Penalties will be assessed. It's a very, very dangerous place if you're misclassifying your employees. And it's like anything, it's a test, a legal test of determining whether somebody is a contractor or they're an employee. The ABC test, right? I mean, very right. nicely named. Make it nice and easy for all of us. It's the ABC test. 
Absolutely. And the ABC test really looks at three factors. And to your point, it's the three pieces. So the A part is you know, the level of control the hiring entity has over that contractor. Is that hiring entity telling you, here's where you have to go every day. Here's the load you're going to take. You don't get to refuse them. Here's the companies you get to work with. Uh, to give a good example of that in real time, there was a Seventh Circuit case with Schneider who was involved, and they had told their independent contractor, you can't haul freight for our competitor. And when they did that, the courts looked and go, that sounds an awful lot like you're controlling what they do in their business. And they ended up losing. And that's why these things are so dangerous. Well, I mean, having come from the industry um, that I worked a lot with independent contractors, I mean, semantics are very important, right? So it's not recruiting, it's sourcing. It's not training, it's providing educational materials. And it's sure as hell not forced dispatch, right? It is offering potential shipments, and that independent contractor has no pressure to accept. Absolutely. Right? No penalty for not accepting. So, you know, very much the carrot and not the stick. And um, one of the, the, the other piece of this ABC test is if you have your own business doing part of what you're having the contractors do. So if you're a brokerage company that has asset-based carriers and you use independence in the state of California, you might have some challenges uh, because at the end of the day, if you're doing the same work as what the employees would be doing, you could find yourself on the other side of having misclassified somebody. So again, these dangers are there and that's why so many companies are, are focused on AB5. But AB5 is just a codification of the existing California law. So this has been the law for, for many, many years in California. I mean, I was one of the biggest vendors for maintenance for FedEx Ground in California for 25 years. And so we knew very well what it took to be a contractor for, for someone like Ground as opposed to being just a, a, in, a different type of independent provider. Right. Anything to add, Dean, before we move on to... Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to ask Matthew, um, one of the things we talked about back in June when the AB5 was uh, became a hot topic, a lot of carriers, of course, were protesting at all the ports. Just curious if you've seen any enforcement of the... Uh, any enforcement activity with carriers? And on the other side, have we seen any class actions by carriers that were misclassified uh, against their... Uh, you know, the, the governing body that was sort of dishing out the work. Have we seen anything back against the industry from those carriers that were misclassified? It's a trickle, right? So the enforcement mechanism of someone being misclassified, it's not the government who comes in and says, hey, I think you two are disagreeing. I think we have to change this. What the reality is, is one of the parties, typically the one who's doing the work goes, hey, am I being misclassified? And then they individually sue that organization with the California labor law. So we are going to see a a lot of like slow trickles and companies have been making really uh, interesting moves to kind of de-risk themselves. So one of the very simple solutions we've seen in the business is, hey, you're an independent contractor. I'll bring you on as an employee and I'll pay you for the truck that I'm going to lease from you. So you have these two revenue sources for the independent contractor. So they become an employee, but they're still getting paid for the asset that they have. But we will see a lot more as time goes on, especially when plaintiff's attorneys realize the opportunity mm. that's in front of them. Exactly. Thank you. Before we move on, Matthew, where's if you're a, if you were if you were a gambler, given our current uh, attire situation, where would you guess, if anywhere, that this legislation pops up next? To AB, it? That's a great question. So the ABC test, which is again, it's a presumption that you're an employee, not that you are presumed to be whatever the hiring entity said. There's over 20 states that use the ABC test today. So that test will continue to grab hold in the markets all across the country. The other test, which we saw the FTC put out in one of their recent uh, publications, is this idea around the economic realities test. And, and that economic reality test is another version of an employment classification thing, which is far more favorable to the industry. So I believe we'll see on the federal level potentially more economic reality stuff. And then on the, the state level, we may see more ABC tests that's going to be more in the liberal states typically. Hmm. All right. So next, moving on to everyone's favorite topic, nuclear verdicts. So here's the deal, folks. Like, I, I'm passionate about this topic. I'm passionate. There is no law that says that's a nuclear verdict. That's like Hiroshima or Nagasaki. It's nothing like that. What it typically refers to is a verdict over $10 million. Now, what is the value of a human life? 
this is the question lawyers get asked all the time. We litigate this question. If you look at the Department of Transportation, they have a statistical valuation of human life. That is $11.2 million. That's the number the DOT associates with the value of a human life. Anytime someone dies, I'm so sorry. It is a nuclear verdict because it'll be over $10 million. What ends up happening, and this is why I'll, I'll stop in a moment, is that this phrase becomes used to say, this is wrong. This person who was injured made too much money. They should not have been paid this much. And they moved it to tort reform conversations. So nuclear verts are not a legal term of art. It is invented to an extent by the industry. And it's used to make you think certain things about the people that sue and the people that are injured. So I'm going to flip that around, right? Because I mean, I, I think it was interesting. That I wanted to clear up sort of the, the nomenclature a bit. So we just came off of our user conference, you know, 350 some of our closest friends and family, if you will. And I was really surprised how we haven't seen them in a while, right? So it's with COVID and everything, you know, it's the first time in, in two or three years seeing kind of the frontline folks, right? And so much talk about carrier fitness. And they weren't saying, I mean, nuclear verdicts came up like it's just like in passing is what to set the context. But um, a lot of these folks, especially the intermediaries are struggling with carrier selection, right? They, they want the government to come out and tell them, is this a fit carrier to handle the shipment? Um, so how do you see, whether it's legislatively or um, through litigation, do you see any pathway towards getting clear on what is a fit carrier? Man, if we could just enforce the existing regulations, just to give an example, every year we have a thing called International Road Check. We also have a thing called the Brake Safety Week, where we do inspections all across the country. And we see numbers between 10 and 20% of vehicles on the road fail for maintenance activity. So we want to make sure carriers are fit. Well, they have to maintain their equipment. So these nuclear verdicts are proxies to we don't want to be on the hook. And staying with the brokers, I mean, the reason they want carrier fitness, I would suspect, is they don't want to be tagged in process. They don't want to get sued. Um, the reality for driving a truck over the, the road is the minimum liability insurance typically is around $750,000. That doesn't get you very much. And so the, the ways you solve it is you make sure your carriers have adequate insurance, maybe five, 10, $15 million. And that could be a, a pathway. But brokers don't want to get involved, I don't think, as much in terms of how you maintain your equipment. So I do think that if we just enforced our regulations that are here now and gave fleets opportunities to better maintain their equipment, I don't think you'd have this really big fear of carrier selection because you want to have the truck driver who can safely deliver freight on time and undamaged. That's really hard to do, but we know how to do it right, which is maintain your equipment, maintain adequate insurance. And for brokers, they all benefit from these things. I, I don't want to see more regulation in terms of how we evaluate a carrier being safe to operate. Uh, it's all about relationships and past performance is by far the best indicator for future behavior. And it's so interesting, right? I mean, we heard about, um, you know, a carrier that on paper definitely looked like a fraudulent carrier, right? They've been in business for 10 years and they haul freight coast to coast and they haven't had an inspection in five years. And the inspection was 2,000 miles away from their domicile location. I mean, so on paper, there's, they're, they're double brokering, right? If, if they're, the only thing that could have been worse was that their area code was out of Glendale, California, right? <laughs> but, you know, the, the intermediary that we were talking to knew that carrier personally. They, they just don't get inspected, right? It's like, why do Six Sigma events happen more frequently than Six Sigma would indicate? You know, so, so I think this is an area that I think there's a lot of ways that tech could help uh, and a lot of ways that we could also see um, improved reporting and scoring across the industry around carrier fitness. Absolutely. I mean, the federal government mandates one annual inspection on your commercial vehicles. And that inspection for a trailer might be an hour long for the truck, might be 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on if you get your oil change, maybe three hours. And that's the minimum the federal government sets. Carriers have to be more proactive in their maintenance. Just because you don't get inspected because you didn't hit the way station where they have the mandatory inspection or you park your vehicles because it's brake safety or national road check, you still have the opportunity to maintain your equipment. And when people are chasing the lowest cost provider, they're not taking care of maintenance. And that's where the gap becomes so devastating in our industry. For sure. For sure. So uh, there was a, everyone loves three-part lists. We've covered two of our three. Do you want to take us through the third? 
Most exciting well, topic. This goes back, I think, to broker liability, man. Like this is, we saw the C.H. Robinson case. A lot of people were concerned about it. And I think this is um, a, a place where you can kind of, it piggybacks along with the nuclear verks. The other one we we're going to talk about is non-competition agreements, but I don't know if we have enough time to really dive into non-competition agreements. Well, let's hit it. Let's, I mean, we're able to run a little bit long. I'm curious your thoughts, right? Because I'm seeing on LinkedIn and other social media sites, a lot of, especially intermediaries, banding together against um, non-competes. So I will be, so, uh, let me be, I'm very passionate about this topic. Okay. Over 30 million Americans have signed a non-competition agreement. 10% of them will negotiate. 90% will not. These things are everywhere. 30 million Americans, 18% of the workforce. Most people do not get a chance to review them. Most people don't get a chance to negotiate them. They just sign them. And then when they leave the job, they get sued. Now, the same can be said to an extent with non-solicitation agreements, but the trend that we've seen in the business is not only state and federal governmental authorities saying we want to curb these things because they are desperately unfair. 30% of people who sign these are making minimum wage so or under 13 bucks an hour in some cases. So it's not made for every ex executives and people selling businesses. It is a first year carrier sales rep who's signing a non-competition agreement and they can't get a job afterwards. So. I look at this issue and think, you know, I have two sons right now. I have twins on the way. My kids will likely be presented with a non-competition agreement. So will all of your kids. So will all of your friends. So will all your family. And if we don't talk about them and teach people how to deal with non-competition agreements, how to negotiate them, how to ask for more money for them, we are doing a disservice to our supply chain because we want the best people to be successful to move freight safely. And if they're locked out of the business because of some non-competition agreement, that's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. I hate these things. I could not possibly agree with you more. I mean, I think they are. Now, I think there's there's a nuanced discussion to be had around like non-solicits, especially in the sales field, right? I mean, I think there are some, I, I, I sort of cut my teeth in the deregulated energy space coming out of college. And as markets were deregulating in the Northeast from Chicago to Jersey, you know, I saw firsthand execs that slipped through the cracks of the paper trail. You know, the the it was really before DocuSign and other electronic routing caught on of, of agreements, you know, take their entire book from one, you know, provider to the other. So I think I don't have as salient of a perspective on non solicits as I do non competes, but I I'm in hundred percent agreement with you. I think especially for non specialized positions, it is you know, BS. <laughs> Yeah, for non-competition, it is it is bad for your customer. It is bad for you as a business, and it's bad for your employees. It, it creates these artificial ways of retention of employees. Look, if you think the only reason you're going to keep your people is because they're locked into your company, that's absurd. Now, this is not legal advice. I never want to give legal advice on a television show. But with the non-solicitation agreement, it is a lock for you specifically. You can't reach out to your former coworkers. You can't reach out to your former clients. They can call you. They can say, hey, where are you at now? Oh, I'm over here. Oh, really? Can I set up an account? Absolutely. So great companies will just rent the contacts from their key salespeople. Salespeople will bounce them out. But the non-solicitation, you can kind of work around that because they can reach out to you and you're generally going to be fine. Yeah. I mean, we see, I mean, our industry, I, I call it the, the biggest small industry in the world, right? I mean, it's a trillion dollar industry, but you'll go to a trade show and you're like, oh, 90% of the people that are doing stuff in this industry are in this hall, this mm -hmm. exhibition hall, right? So I think, yeah, we, you know, we move around and we, 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 most folks, at least anyway, stay amicable with each other, even after they've departed. Um, there are a few notable exceptions there, but, but yeah, I mean, I think this is going to be an interesting space. I've, I'm very pleased to see some of these coalitions forming around, the, you know, the ending non-competes in the brokerage space. Um, and I'm hopeful that that is something that will continue. Because to your things, point, I mean, I worry about the future of work. Like, what does that look like? Well, this one thing, so the state of Illinois has done a pretty good job trying to protect people with non-competition agreements and non-solicitation agreements as, as well. They require you give the employee 14 days, 14 days to review it. They don't have to sign it same day. And if they don't, you can be liable for penalties. They also ban them for workers that are making under a certain dollar amount. So we, we expect businesses to make good decisions and be ethical actors in our, in our supply chain and in our industries generally. But when they're not willing to do that, 
legislators will come in and they'll correct it. And that's the, the trend that we're seeing is states stepping up and saying, we're going to stop these types of agreements because they're not good for anybody. But I'm with you, Ken. It's a nightmare to see so many people who reach out to me and tell me how their lives have been ruined because they go work at another company, they get a cease and desist letter, they get their new company threatened to sue, new company fires them, and what do they do next? They, they mm. wait for another job. It's just right. it's ridiculous. Mm. I will tell you one interesting way, um, Dean might know what, <laughs> if you can get your former employer on video detesting, or on television detesting and, and, and proclaiming that non-competes are non-enforceable, that is a great way to, uh, to, um, to get out of a non-compete, I would, yeah. I would add. I mean, just, uh, I want to build off that. So there's a company called Jimmy John's based out of Champaign, oh. Illinois. They sell great sandwiches. They made every single employee sign non-competition agreements. And the non this is bizarre. It would be for two years after you leave, you cannot work for any establishment that gets more than 10% of their revenue from cold sandwiches. And that was all across the country within three mile radius. And this is a store with, with thousands of locations, but they did this until they got sued. But many companies know the non-competition agreement isn't enforceable, but they also know that you're not going to test them. And if you're not going to test them, you're not going to go work at a company that makes 10% of their revenue or more from cold sandwiches. Wow. Yeah, maybe it was Brad Garrett. Have you seen? I love those commercials. But <laughs> I was a lifelong Jimmy John's guy. Uh, all th I mean, Jimmy John's got me through college eating Jimmy John's anyway. And now I'm a Jersey Mike's all the way. I mean, honestly, if you have like a, a, a TQL non-competition agreement, and you go to work at Jimmy John's as a driver, you're probably violating that non-competition agreement based on that TQL document. It's it's incredible. The business is amazing. I love this business. This yeah, is it's it's something new every day. All right. Are you up for a couple uh, listener questions, Matt? Yeah, I'll give the best I can. All right. So we have one. Uh, what kind of liability is a shipper exposed to if they use a broker or carrier that is loaded with an inactive authority insurance and ends up in an accident? Oh, that's interesting. The day you have shipper liability is the day you have much safer highways, uh, fundamentally. So my belief is, and again, this is not legal advice, not don't take this from a TV show. Uh, I don't think the shippers are going to find much liability unless they're actively a part of this selection of the carrier. Their entire job for the, from the perspective of the shipper is I give it to the broker. That's on you. That's your liability. And the contract with the broker probably has an indemnity clause saying, if I do get sued, if I am tagged in process, you're going to protect me. You're going to pay for it. Otherwise, we're not going to sign a contract. So shippers are very, very good at protecting themselves. Now, that doesn't mean they don't get sued. They was, certainly would get sued, but they would then either motion to dismiss or get themselves out. Mm. If the carrier is actively using a broker that they know does not do the job correctly, there could be a pathway for some negligent retention of the brokerage that then got the carrier. But these are each step of the transaction of who has custody and control or who's in the intermediary of this mm. business is just another layer of liability insurance that the shipper is going to tag to say, you cover this. Shippers are very smart in reducing their liability. This is why they got rid of their supply chains. Walmart's a, an exception to this where they have their own fleet, but big shippers realize the liability of how hard it is to operate a commercial vehicle, how hard it is to maintain a commercial vehicle, outsource it, don't worry about it. Let someone else take the liability. So that would be my my gut answer for that question. Love it. Uh, Dean, this one's probably more for you. Can I buy a truck and not get my authority? I'm not sure. I mean, you have your truck and your authority, right? So I yeah. Um, I'd love to hear Matthew's answer on this one because I, I hear this a lot from owner-operators who are thinking about buying a truck. And then the question is, well, I can't afford to get my authority. And uh, if I'm outside of California... Um, can I still operate as an independent contractor? It sounds like that door is closing, but for the time being, I, I could still do that, right, Matthew? I think so. I mean, you can always get a commercial vehicle and not move commercial freight. You can just drive it recreationally and don't have to get any of the, the regulations. That's one of the right. beautiful things about uh, not doing things for profit. Now, if you are going to get a truck and you want to haul freight for money, you could probably lease someone else's DOT number or operate under someone else's authority. That's a possibility. I don't know um, how California is going to deal with situations like that. I believe as time goes on and, and this law gets more litigated and we learn the, the what the actual mm -hmm. You know, pathway to not getting sued is going to be is likely to have your own authority, have a separate organization, whether it's a sub S corporation or a limited liability company, and have all of the bells and whistles of a independent business. 
That's interesting. Maybe I'll go buy a Class 8 truck, and it might be cheaper than buying like a Toyota Corolla right now at this point. <laughs> The, the fuel economy um, is not desirable, but you can haul a great big boat. I have no doubt about that. No doubt about it. Didn't, yeah. I think Peterbilt makes like a smaller, like macho version of, it's like a dumbed down version of a semi truck. I forget what it's called. Um, so Brandy or Bandy, I'm sorry, asked, what's the national average fuel surcharge right now? And uh, 68. Hot, 68 cents. Hot tip. Uh, if you're a DAT customer and you go to iq.dat.com, we just launched a new uh, IQ homepage, which you should have access to. Um, it has some very high-level metrics. You'll get like the state-level outbound MCI map. You'll get national spot and contract rates going back, uh, I think, six weeks. You'll get the fuel surcharge. You also get uh, lane rates for the top uh, five lanes for each equipment type, plus rate cast for those, um, and then links to all of Dean's content on a weekly basis. So that's iq.dat.com. That launched a couple weeks ago. That'll get you all the information you need. Um, one more. When do we think the market's going to level out? My answer is never, but Dean, what, <laughs> what, how do you, how do you, do you want to apply some nuance on that? I, I thought before diesel went up uh, a bunch last week that we'd, we'd be starting to see a flattening out of spot rates heading into some of the seasonality inflationary trends that we typically see. Uh, diesel up 50 cents in two weeks is going to bring down the underlying line haul rate uh, significantly. Uh, the, whether the actual, you know, the, the contract rate moves a lot, I'm not sure. The, I think it's up six cents a week, the, the fuel surcharge. So shippers are going to be paying a lot more to move freight. Um, at the moment, uh, I, I don't know. My instinct is that it'll be flat. I, I think we'll. I think we're seeing the bottom of the freight market right now in terms of spot rates this side of Christmas. I think it'll be relatively flat. It'll flatten out as as our forecasts are sort of heading towards at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think you just got to think of things in terms of like time period. I mean, over the long arc of time, the market's always moving, right? It's always following that sign curve. Um, but over the short term, I, I think I tend to agree with you. There's too much upward seasonal pressure. I think you're gonna, you're already seeing a lot of the retailers offering discounts uh, to try to pump volume through uh, their networks. So, um, I mean, it's either a cliff or a mountain, depending on what your perspective is and where you're looking at it, right? So I don't know that we need to get too hyperbolic about where the market sits. Um, we all know the seasonality that we're heading into. And um, commensurate, commensurate with that seasonality is it, it will be slow in, in late January oh, through February. Yeah. Right? There's no yeah. doubt about that. So, Absolutely. All right. Well, let's wrap up. I want to thank you a ton, Matthew. This has been super informative. Um, I believe I'll be heading on your podcast at some point in the near future. Absolutely. I would love to have you. I'm going to schedule that relatively soon. I appreciate you making time for me to come on and talk about some of these really interesting topics that are facing our supply chains. The advice I give everybody, uh, if you're presented with a, with a contract you don't understand, just ask for time to review it. That's the easiest thing to say is, hey, just give me a, give me a couple weeks to look it over. And then uh, if you can, if it's a non-competition, non-solicitation, maybe get a, get a lawyer. If you can't get a lawyer, you can negotiate. You just push back. You've, if you're a freight broker, you're negotiating things every single day. Why can't you negotiate your post-employment restrictive covenants? I think that's timeless Great advice stuff. from the armchair yeah. attorney there. Dean, plugs? Yeah, uh, quickly, Ken, sales chat is on tomorrow with Dan Deegan, 9 a.m. Eastern. Connect with him on LinkedIn. Uh, Inam Ayub will be on the Mark Willis Show later today at 3 p.m. Eastern on our favorite channel, Road Dog Radio, channel 146 on Sirius XM. Um, I'll also be on the same channel on Landline Now tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, don't forget that the new Freight Buying podcast is out this week. Uh, it'll be out Thursday. features Bill Cassidy, our good friend from the Journal of Commerce. Of course, we'll all be at DAT. Uh, DAT will be at next week's TIA's Tech Innovations Conference in Phoenix. Uh, don't forget to go to dat.com forward slash market update to download the long form version of our market update for this week. And with that, it's back to Ken to wrap up the show. Yeah, I, I saw a couple questions come in late. If you want to shoot those over to uh, askiq at dat.com, that's askiq at dat.com. We'll get those answered for you throughout the course of the week. Um, and with that, we will be signing off for this week. We'll be live next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern. I hope everyone has a great week. It's going to be cold for a large part of the country. It's going to be snowy. So I advise you to stay warm, stay safe, and have a great rest of your week. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.